Good morning, everyone. Welcome to another day of Aquarium Online Academy. My name is Sarah. I work in the education department here at the Aquarium of the Pacific in Long Beach, California. And we are so excited that you're joining us this morning because we're going to talk about my favorite topic, my favorite group of animals in the ocean. We're going to talk all about sharks. Now, I hope you like sharks. Maybe you're a little iffy on whether you like sharks or not, and maybe we can convince you how cool these animals are. Now, before we get started talking about these fascinating animals, I wanna tell you a couple things. We would love to hear from you. So we have a couple numbers that you can use to reach out to us. Uh, we are I'm not alone in the studio. I have got Dana working the computer and she's gonna change all the screens you see behind me. And she just put up this text line right here. So you can text us if you wanna share observations, if you have questions, if you wanna know more about something that I mentioned, please text us at this number. It's 562-286-1838. And then I have Cynthia and she is sitting at our computer and she will take all of your observations and questions and send them into me in the studio. And we can really talk about what you wanna know more about in regards to sharks. Now, if you're watching this program live, so it is Tuesday, Wednesday, Wednesday morning, uh, November 25th, the day before Thanksgiving. If you're watching live 9 a.m., you can text us. But if you're watching after that time, we still wanna hear all your thoughts and your questions, but we do ask that you email us and that email address is right below that phone number. It's live at lbaop.org. So if you're watching live, go ahead and text us. And if you're watching after, go ahead and email us. We would love to hear from you. All right, everyone, are you ready to get started? So we are gonna talk about sharks, but I wanna start talking about being a scientist first. Because a lot of times we greet everyone and we say, good morning, scientists. And when we ask you questions, <coughs> excuse me, we refer to you as scientists. So I want you to think for a moment about what you would need as a shark scientist to study sharks. So think about, if you are gonna go study some sharks, what are some tools that you might wanna bring with you to study those animals? Now, while you're thinking, I'm gonna have Dana put up our shark lagoon. So we have a lot of cameras in our exhibits here at the aquarium, and you can go to our website and find them. And then you can watch what's happening in our exhibits in real time. So Dana's gonna bring up the camera that we have in shark lagoon. and I want you to think about if you were going to study these animals, either at an aquarium or if you're going out into the open ocean to study these animals, what kinds of tools would you want to bring with you? Think about would you need any equipment, any kind of special clothing, any tools? What would you bring with you as a shark scientist in order to study these animals? All right, I'm going to step off the screen as you take a moment to observe these animals and think about what tools you would bring. And you can go ahead and text us. You can just think your answers. You can share them with anyone around you. You can whisper them. You can say them out loud, but if someone is working around you, let's be mindful of that. All right, did you think of any tools that you might need when you're studying these animals? Now think about, if you are going out to study, or if I'm going to study, one of the first things we need is just to be ourselves, right? Because we have a lot of tools on our body that can help us study these animals. And one of the big things that scientists do is we make a lot of observations. Have you heard that word before? Observations. What does it mean to make an observation? We're gonna use our senses to make observations, specifically these things right here our eyes. So when we make observations, we are looking and we are talking about what we see in front of us. So we can make a lot of observations to study these animals just by watching this camera feed in Shark Lagoon. So let's start to think about not only what tools you might use, but also what observations can you make? If we are studying sharks, what observations can we make that might help us ask questions or learn more about these animals? Now I see Cynthia is writing some things down. So Hopefully we're getting some answers and keep them coming. So now we're thinking about two different things. Not only what tools might we need or bring with us to study these animals, but also starting to make some observations about these animals. All right, Emma and James, ooh, swimming clothes and a magnifying glass. Excellent, Emma and James. So if you're gonna get in the water with these animals, you definitely need the right clothes. Now, if we're swimming with these sharks here, a bathing suit might be perfect because these are tropical sharks. And so this water is really warm. It's in the high 70s. It's nice and uh, warm and comforting. 
at a bathing suit would be just fine. But if we are going to study sharks maybe here along our coast in Southern California or some other parts of the Pacific, it might be a little colder and you might need more of a wetsuit. So a sort of a thicker bathing suit that covers your whole body and keeps you nice and warm. And then a magnifying glass. Absolutely. We're going to take a look at some things a little bit closer later. We kind of have a big magnifying glass. It's our document camera. But if you find maybe some shark teeth or something on the beach and you want to look at it closely or look at little different parts of it, you might need a magnifying glass. So those are two excellent suggestions of things that scientists might need to study sharks. Now, we talked about our, using our senses. That's one way we can study. If we're looking at these animals, maybe you might want a boat if you're going to go out into the open ocean looking for these animals. You might need, hmm, what other things could you need? Maybe a notepad and a pencil or a pen, something to write down your notes. So there's lots of different th tools that a scientist might use to study these animals. But today we're going to focus on using our observations to start. We're going to use our eyes and take a look. So let's see, how do we know that these animals are sharks? What behaviors, what things do they do, what on their body tells us that these animals are sharks? Because I did mention we're talking about sharks and we brought up our shark lagoon. So those are all hints, but if we didn't say specifically we were talking about sharks, how would we know that these animals are sharks? Now I'm gonna have Dana bring up a picture of what we call sort of our typical looking shark. It's going right by right now, but we'll look at a really pretty picture. So this right here is a gray reef shark, and this shark may be new to you, but sort of looking at the body, the general features of it, that's sort of what we look at, think about when we think of a typical shark. Ooh, and we just got a comment from Audrey. Ooh, do sharks get itchy? And how old are they? Those are very interesting questions, Audrey. So, do sharks get itchy? Well, let's think about what covers their body. Do they have anything covering their body? They definitely do have skin covering their body. Otherwise, their organs would just fall out everywhere. But shark skin has scales on it because sharks are a type of fish, but their scales are different than most of the tropical or bony fish we think about. Shark scales are what we call modified scales. We call them dermal denticles. Now those are two big words, you may not have heard them before, but dermal is your skin. We call it your epidermis is your skin. So dermal is skin and denticle all your teeth, like you go to the dentist to take care of your teeth. So dermal denticles are their skin. So it's basically like skin teeth. Now I don't think we have any images or uh, bio facts of their skin, but I'm gonna grab my uh, whiteboard and I'm gonna turn on my document camera and I'm gonna show you what we mean when we say skin teeth. It looks like little mountains. I'm gonna have Dana go to our document camera. So if we were to look under a microscope, which is what you would need to look at the scales of a shark, they would look like little mountains, just like this, little teeth. And they can actually be pretty pointy. Now, when we look at that gray reef shark, I'm going back and forth. When we look at that gray reef shark in just a moment, when we look at their body, it looks really, really smooth. So here comes that gray reef shark. It looks really, really smooth and shiny. And that's because all of those sort of skin teeth, all those little points in mountains, they sit really close together and really flat. And that gives them this really smooth body. It allows them to be hydrodynamic. Now you may have heard the word aerodynamic when you're flying through the air. And hydrodynamic means in the water. So it allows them to swim really, really smooth and fast through the water. There's not a lot of drag. There's not a lot of things pulling them down. So they can be really efficient swimmers. And so those skin teeth cover their body. Now, sometimes we do see sharks, especially when we're watching a shark balloon, kind of rub up against some of the coral or rock structures. Now, we don't know for sure if they get itchy, but we can make an assumption. We can, based on our observations, we can take a guess that maybe they have something that's a little bit uncomfortable on their skin. And so they're rubbing up against that coral or that rock to kind of scratch it off. So they could be a little bit itchy. That was a great question. And then uh, Audrey also asked, how old are our sharks? Now, our sharks range in age. Our sharks in here, we have a, three different types of sharks in Shark Lagoon. The one that just swam down at the bottom, that is our black tip reef shark. You'll notice the top of its fin, or the edge of all its fins, have black, almost like it was dipped in black paint. And then this one coming towards us on this far side here, that is our gray reef shark. And then we have two zebra sharks in here. Now, they all range in age. Our gray reef sharks, we have three of them. They are going to be the youngest sharks in here. They're only about three years old. They joined our group of sharks about a year and a half ago, I believe. So they're on the younger side. Now our black tip reef sharks, they are a bit older. I believe they're probably in their late teens, early 20s. And same with our zebra sharks. So it just depends on the type of shark we're looking at. But sharks 
they can live a really long time and it really does depend on the species. The longest lived shark, I believe, is the Greenland shark, which can live a couple hundred years. Can you imagine that? That's a really long time. Some sharks live a little bit shorter, only in the 20, 30, 40. Some live about 70, 80, and some can live a couple hundred years. It just depends on the type of shark. All right, Emma and James, they said they have fins and a tail. Excellent. So let's go back to that picture of our typical looking shark, our gray reef shark. All right, so when we take a look at this shark here, I'm going to try to stand off so I'm not standing in front of its face. I asked what things on this shark's body tell us that it's a shark, and Emma and James said that they have fins and they have a tail, which is absolutely correct. So my gray reef shark, maybe I'll stand over here so I'm not standing in front of its face. Our gray reef shark has fins here. This is their dorsal fin. They've got fins right here. This is their caudal or, si or sorry, their pectoral fins, and then their tail is their caudal fin, and they move their tail in a special way. They move their tail side to side. So you can clap your hands together and move your hands side to side. And that is how a shark moves its tail side to side. So looking at their fins, if we see fins, we can, can guess this could be a shark. But then even further, looking at their tail and the way they move it, that's another sign that it's a shark. Because if we see an animal whose tail is flat, step more on the screen, and moves up and down like this, that is going to be a mammal, something like a whale or a dolphin. But if we see their tail moving side to side, we know it could be a fish or a shark. So fins and their tail are good indicators that this animal we're looking at is a shark. But what else tells us it's a shark? Because I mentioned a fish or a shark. Now, sharks are a type of fish. Fish is a big group of animals, and we break all those animals down into smaller groups based on their skeleton. So we think about fish are bony fish. Their skeleton is made of bone, like our skeleton. And then sharks, here we go. This is a bony fish. This is a Garibaldi. It's a California state fish. And this is what we would call a bony fish. So sort of when we think of fish, that term, these are the type of animals we think about. But we could also be referring, oh, here's a good one. This is a parrotfish. Look how colorful they are. This is called a bicolor parrotfish. And it's the largest parrotfish that we have here at the aquarium. Now, when we say that term fish, you probably think of an animal like this or the Garibaldi, but you never know. Someone could be referring to a shark because a shark is a fish. So we call these bony fish. And then sharks are cartilaginous fish. So that means their skeleton is not made of bone like our skeleton. It's made entirely of cartilage. Now, we do have some cartilage in our body. Most of our skeleton is made of bone, but we have a little bit of cartilage in our body. Do you know where? Go ahead and point to where you think you have cartilage in your body, or you can text us in. I'm going to go like this. Did you point to your nose? Or did you point to your ears? Because we have cartilage both in our nose and our ears. Now, if you move your nose side to side, or you kind of fiddle with your ear a little bit, they're pretty flexible and bendy, and that's what cartilage is. And that allows shark skeleton to be really flexible and move very fluidly through the water. So we, if we watch our sharks swim in here, we'll notice how graceful of swimmers they are. And that is because of their cartilaginous skeleton. If they had that bony skeleton, their body would be more rigid, sort of stiff, and they wouldn't be able to move in that sort of fluid motion. I kind of think of it, they move like this, whereas fish kind of move like this. Bony fish, our cartilaginous fish kind of move more in this type of motion. And that's because of that flexible skeleton. So we know sharks have fins and they have that caudal tail. Now, if we go back to that picture of our gray reef shark, there's a couple other things that we can look at that tell us it's a shark. I want to point out these things right here, these lines. Do you think those are just decorations on our shark to give it a nice little pattern? No, they're not decorations. Those are a really important part of our shark's body. Those are the shark's gills. Now, the bony fish, like when we looked at the Garibaldi and the parrotfish, they have gills too. But a difference between a bony fish and a cartilaginous fish are their gills. So if we go back to the picture of one of those two bony fish, I'll let Dana pick which one she wants to bring up. Ah, excellent. So if we look right here, this line is where the gills are for our parrotfish. It's a gill covering, and underneath it are these filaments. It kind of looks like a brush or a broom, and the fish is going to bring water into its mouth, and it's going to go over that big area where their gill is, underneath that gill covering, and then that water is going to be released, and the tiny oxygen bubbles that are in the water are going to get caught on those gill filaments. So they have one gill covering with their gills underneath. Now our shark had all those lines going down its body, just like this. So they actually have five gill slits. So bony fish have one gill covering, 
sharks have five gill slits. Now, we do like to say it's most sharks that have five gill slits because a lot of times in science there are exceptions. We never want to say every single shark because science will always prove us wrong. So most sharks have five gill slits and underneath those gills they have the similar uh, types of filaments and gill rakers that help catch those oxygen bubbles to allow them to breathe. But we say most because there is one shark in the ocean that doesn't have five. Actually, there's two. There's one shark that actually has six gill slits. Now, would you like to take a guess at what shark it is that has still six gill slits? Now, it's not going to be the gray reef shark because the gray reef shark right here has five gill slits. Bless you. But there is that one shark that has six gill slits, and the name might surprise you. We call it the six gill shark. I know Dana is shocked. Sometimes in science, when we name an animal, we come up with these really creative names, and sometimes we just call it like we see it. Six gills means it's a six-gilled shark. Now, there's more exceptions, because there's also one shark that has seven gill slits. Do you want to take a guess at its name? I bet you can get this one. It's called the seven-gilled shark. So most sharks, like I said, have five gill slits. One has six gill slits, the six-gilled shark, and there's one that has seven gill slits, the seven-gilled shark. So those gills are really important, and that can tell us that this animal is a shark. It's a cartilaginous fish because cartilaginous fish have these gill slits. Bony fish have that gill covering. So we talked about fins and their tail and how they move side to side. We even talked about their scales, and their scales are different. Let's bring up one of those bony fish again, and we'll take a look at how different their scales are. So for sharks, it just looks like they have skin, but can you see all this texture and pattern on this Garibaldi? Those are all their scales. And then here is that parrotfish. And again, you can see all those texture and pattern. Those are their scales. So looking at most bony fish, we can see their scales with what we call our naked eye. We don't need any extra tools to see their scales. But if we we're going to look at the scales of a shark, we would need that uh, microscope because just looking at them, it just, just kind of looks like they have really smooth skin. But we know that they actually do have scales. And they're those little skin teeth, those little dermal denticles. And then we talked about sharks have gills, but what about this thing right here? What's that? Their mouth. Now, shark mouths are actually really interesting, and they can tell us a lot about that animal. And that works for a lot of animals, not just sharks. But looking at, <clears throat> excuse me, looking at their mouth, where it is, and what's in their mouth can tell us a lot about that animal. One, where it's going to find its food, and two, also what it eats. Now, shark mouth. Let's take a look at some up close because I have some jaws of some sharks. So I'm going to switch over to my document camera. And looking at that, we were just that picture that we just saw was a black tip reef shark. This jaw here is not from a black tip reef shark. This, whoa, that's too bright. Give us a moment. Oh, stop moving. We're just trying to adjust our document camera to give you the best view. There we go. So this is a baby great white jaw, which is not the same as that black tip reef shark, but it's similar in sort of where the mouth is placed on that animal and also sort of looking at their teeth, sort of similar in what they might eat. Now, they do have different uh, food types that they like to eat or different favorite foods, but where the mouth is tells us a lot. So when we were looking at that black tip reef shark, their mouth was sort of towards the bottom, but facing forward. And if we bring up a picture of a great white shark, we can get a better look at that sort of forward facing mouth. There we go. Now this is another shark that when you think about a shark, this is probably one of the ones that you think about. Sort of our very typical looking shark with its fins, its body shape, its gill slits right here, and then its mouth. So right here is the mouth of that shark. And that was similar to the black tip reef shark. Same with our gray reef sharks. All those sort of typical sharks you think about, this is where their mouth is. So it's sort of below their snout, their nose, but it's frontward facing. And this tells us that this animal is going to be looking for food in front of them. They're not going to be foraging below them. They're not going to be looking really above them necessarily, but they're going to go forward to grab their food. Now, if we look at their teeth specifically, looking at the shape of the teeth, it tells us what they're going to eat. So great white sharks are an interesting animal. As juveniles, as babies, they're going to eat something different than they are as adults, and that's because their mouth is going to be smaller. So juvenile or baby or kid great white sharks, they're mostly going to feed on things like squid and fish, which is going to be the main food that things like those 
black tip reef sharks and our gray reef sharks are going to be eating. So they all eat similar foods when great white sharks are juveniles. But as adults, great white sharks are so much larger than those reef sharks. Those reef sharks only get about six or seven feet long. But our black, or um, sorry, our great white shark can get up to about 20 feet. So they need to eat something a lot bigger that's going to give them a lot more energy and a lot more nutrients for their body. And so they actually feed on things like seals and sea lions. Now, what helps them feed on seals and sea lions that maybe we wouldn't find in the mouth of a great uh, gray reef shark or a black tip reef shark is the shape of their top teeth and what we can notice on their top teeth. I'm going to see if I can get a little bit closer. It's a little hard to see. Let's give it a moment to sort of adjust. But great white sharks have what we call serrated teeth. So you can kind of see it on, let me see this one, these right here. Oh, let's see if I can zoom in a little teeny bit more. There we go. That's better. Excellent. So you can see along these top teeth. Do they look smooth? So the front of it, the flat part, might look smooth. But if you look along the edges, they are what we call serrated. Kind of like you would use the type of knife, the type of knife you would use to cut bread is serrated. It's kind of got those little scalloped or sort of little bumps on it. And that's to help you cut. And so great white shark's teeth, they are serrated on the edge, and that helps them grab a hold of their food, seals and sea lions, that might have fur and thicker skin than things like fish and squid. Now, <clears throat> I'm going to bring up another jaw. And this one is from a blue shark. Now, a blue shark is going to eat things similar to those reef sharks. And so their teeth, I'm going to zoom out a little bit. Actually, this is the lower part of their jaw. Look how different those teeth are. Give it a minute, it'll focus, hopefully. So look how different these teeth are. These teeth are a lot more straight and pointy and skinny. So think about these skinny teeth trying to bite into something really thick like the fur or the skin of a sea lion or sea lion would probably break their teeth. So these sharks that have these really long skinny teeth are going to be feeding on things more like fish and squid. So our reef sharks and then also one of our other sharks here, our sand tiger shark, has a really good example of these long and skinny teeth. So we're going to bring up a picture of our sand tiger shark's mouth. So this shark's mouth placement is similar to both reef sharks and the great white shark, but check out its teeth. Do those look like the teeth of the great white shark? Not at all. They're really long. They're very skinny and they also curve inward. And so this shark, their teeth are good for grabbing a hold of slippery fish and then pulling them into their mouth. And they're curved so that when they hold onto their fish, they can pull it into their mouth without the fish swimming out. Ooh, Emma and James said they see little bumps on it. And I'm guessing you're talking about those great white shark teeth. Ooh, so they, uh, Emma and James said that, that the, I'm guessing the blue shark jaw looks different and they look like little airplanes. Oh, I totally see it. Let's go back to our document camera. Look at that. Looks like little airplanes. I like it. I like the way you guys are thinking. That's good. So another thing scientists do is we make comparisons and that helps us sort of visualize things and understand things because we can compare it to something we know. We use our past knowledge or other knowledge of things that we have learned and that helps us understand new things that we are looking at. So excellent job, Emma and James. All right, so our sand tiger shark has those long skinny teeth that help it bring those fish into its mouth. Now, we've spent most of this class time talking about these sort of typical sharks, but we have about eight minutes, seven, eight minutes left, and I wanna talk about two other sharks that are not our typical looking sharks. Now, one of them we have here, and then one of them is my favorite animal in the whole entire world, and I would never teach a shark class without mentioning it. But first, the shark that we have here. Let's take a look at our zebra shark. Now, is anyone shocked when I said we're looking at our zebra shark and this is the animal that Dana brought up? Yeah, maybe. Sometimes people are a little confused when we call this a zebra shark because if you look at it, does that look like a zebra? Probably thinking, Sarah, you need to go back and study your animals. This is a cheetah print, right? Or a leopard. Now, our zebra sharks, they are native to Australia. And if you travel to Australia and you see a shark that looks like this, you'll hear people in Australia call it a leopard shark. That's what it is, it's a leopard shark. But here in California, if you go swimming in the kelp forest, you might see a shark and hear someone call it a leopard shark. 
and it looks completely different. Let's take a look. I think we have a picture Dana can bring up really quick. This is the leopard truck you find here in California. Do they look the same? Not really. So calling them both leopard sharks would be really confusing, especially because we have both of those sharks here. So can you imagine someone saying, did you feed the leopard sharks? It would be confusing. Which shark are you talking about? So even though in Australia they call these leopard sharks, we here in California, we call them something different. We call them zebra sharks. Now, we didn't just choose a random animal to name this shark. Actually, as babies, when these sharks are born, they have black and white stripes like a zebra. And then as they grow, those stripes kind of break apart and it turns into this leopard print you see here. But looking at this shark, does this look the same as those sharks we were talking about before? I'm going to step off. Does its body look the same as those gray reef sharks, those black tip reef sharks, the great white, even the sand tiger shark? So here's what we call a juvenile. So it's not a baby. As a baby, it would be black and white, but it's not quite an adult. You can still see sort of remnants of those stripes as they're sort of fading away and those spots are coming more clear. But looking at its body, does it look like any of those sharks we talked about? Its body is really different. It's got this longer tail, but it still has fins. So it's got its tail fin, its caudal fin. It's got a dorsal fin, but it's definitely not as pointy or as tall as those other dorsal fins we were looking at. It's got its pectoral fins. It has its gills right here. But what you can't see is its mouth. Now I'm going to have Dana go back to that first picture of the zebra shark she was showing us because this picture is up close and you can almost kind of see even their scales. It looks a little bit like sandpaper, little speckles, and those are the scales. But you can kind of also see their mouth here. But their mouth is on the bottom. So if we were to be a great white shark or a reef shark, our mouth would be sort of where our current mouth is. But if we were going to be a zebra shark, our mouth would be on the bottom. It'd be underneath us. So rather than grabbing food in front of us, if your mouth is on the bottom, that means your food is going to be found below you. So zebra sharks, they are what we call bottom feeders. So their mouth is on the bottom, so they're going to be feeding on things below them, and they're going to find their food living sort of in the sand or in whatever the substrate on the bottom. It could be rocky, it could be a little muddy, it could be sandy. So they're going to be feeding on things like clams and mussels and other invertebrates, maybe worms, crustaceans, things that they can find below them in the sand that they can grab a hold of. Now we're going to quickly take a look. I have a zebra shark jaw. And think about how different this jaw looks than those other jaws we were looking at. Going to zoom out. Camera's got a little bit of a delay, so we just want to make sure that you can see it the best that we can. I'm going to go a little bit closer. So this is their whole mouth. It fits on this screen, and I had to zoom in. And then you can see all these tiny little teeth. So their teeth are really, really small. So they're very different than those other shark jaws we were looking at. And that's because their food isn't going to be very big. And they just need those tiny sharp teeth to grab a hold of their food and then pull it into their mouth. So that is one of our sort of not your typical looking sharks. That is our zebra shark. Now, with our last two minutes, we're going to cover my favorite shark in the whole entire world. Now, we have a question. So I want you to think, can anyone guess what my favorite shark might be, I'll give you a hint. It's the biggest shark. It's the biggest fish in the ocean. Any ideas? Have you heard about the biggest shark or the biggest fish in the ocean? I'll give you a couple minutes, a couple seconds if you want to text it in, or you can think it, or I might teach you a new shark today. But I'm going to take Ollie has a question. Ollie says, why do the, does the zebra shark have so many fins? Ooh, excellent question, Ollie. And how does he use them? Great. Let's pull up a picture of a zebra shark real quick. That's an excellent question, Ollie, because we talked about how sh sharks have fins. Yeah, we're going to bring up one with a whole body, that juvenile, so we can see it again. So you're right. It looks like this shark has a lot more fins. It's got these pectoral fins. It's got a fin here. It's got another one here. It's got one there. It looks like a little lobe here, and then the tail fin. So sharks can have varying amounts of fins, but all their fins are used for swimming. Now, they are used in different ways for swimming. This dorsal fin up top is used mostly for balance. So because of the way that a shark's body is shaped, if they didn't have fins, they would spin in a spiral. So that top dorsal fin helps them with balance. Now the faster moving the shark is, the taller that dorsal fin. So when we were looking at those reef sharks, they had that really pointy dorsal fin. Those are going to be faster swimming sharks. A zebra shark, not so fast because they don't have that pointy dorsal fin. And then their pectoral fins are used more for balance and steering. And then all these other fins help with balance and their caudal tail helps them move forward. So all of their fins serve a really important purpose, but they're all used for balance and for swimming. 
All right. Now we're going to move on to the last shark. And Emma and James, you got it right. They guessed a whale shark. Now, whale sharks are my favorite animal in the whole entire world. Not just my favorite ocean animal. This shark right here. Now, there are some parts of this shark that might look like your typical shark. They have a really big dorsal fin. It's kind of hard to see. They have a really big dorsal fin towards the back. They have their pectoral fins. They've got a long caudal fin. But check out this mouth. Does that look like the other mouth of the sharks? I mean, it's front facing, similar to those, the great white shark and the reef sharks. It's not on the bottom like the zebra shark, but does it look like the same shape? Here we go. Definitely not. Dana did a nice little sound effect with it. She went, Wah! which is sort of how I think whale sharks sound when they're feeding. So whale sharks are what we call filter feeders. So they're not a bottom feeder because they're not feeding on the bottom like a zebra shark. And they're not going to be eating big things like fish and squid or seals and sea lions like great whites. They are going to be feeding on plankton, tiny little things floating in the ocean. Now, we're about out of time, but I'm going to show you one thing before we go, because we actually have a replica jaw from a whale shark. Check it out. I have to even step back in our studio to make sure that you can see this whole jaw. So whale sharks are the largest fish in the ocean. They get about, on average, about 40 feet long. But the long, largest on record is about 60 feet, which is almost the length of two school buses. And they have this big, big mouth, and they swim with their mouth open, and they're just pulling in water, and they're filtering out. There's tiny little shrimp and tiny little fish and other planktonic animals in the water that they're going to bring in the water, push the water out their gills, and catch all those tiny foods in order to eat it. So they are the largest shark, but they're also the friendliest sharks. We call them the gentle giants because... They have teeny tiny teeth that they don't even use. They're just going to filter out all the tiny food they're going to eat. Now, I'm going to leave you with this beautiful image of our whale shark as we say goodbye for today. Except, you know what? Not goodbye for today because we do have another class coming up at 10. It's going to be a class in Spanish. Now, Cynthia is going to be teaching it, and it's a new program today. So if you speak Spanish, if you're practicing or you want to learn Spanish, tune in at 10 o'clock to uh, hear our new Spanish program with Cynthia. And if not, we will see you again next week. Have a good rest of your day.